Hey everyone, this is Jen, and I'm nothing if not intense in my search for the truth about the events that happened in Las Vegas on the night of October 1st and into October 2nd. It's super important that we find out the truth. Bottom line, we need the truth. Everybody deserves it. So what I want to do is just review part one with Jesus and Stephen Shuck and the anatomy of the lie. That's my bullshit meter right there, and as you can see, it's off the charts. <laughs> the official narrative. To me, that's like the theory of the big lie, Hitler's thing, you know. If you say something completely outrageous, but if you repeat it often enough, many will finally believe you. And I think that that's what they have done with the official narrative. Some of it's just, we know it's completely outrageous, but they just keep repeating it and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it. And it may be working for them. So what we need to look at is just the points crucial to their narrative that they want us to believe. First is that Jesus, the last room he was to check was 32129, that the stairwell door was blocked, leading to the 32nd, store, 32nd floor, pardon me, that he took the stairs to floor 33 and then dropped back down in a guest elevator to floor 32. Now this part, I haven't quite figured out, but to me, they don't want to put Jesus on the 31st floor. They don't want him anywhere near that floor. Now, he puts himself there, but officially, they do not put him there in the FIT report. They do not put him on the 30, 31st floor at all. Every time they mention anything, it's he was at, on the 30th floor and had to go up to the 32nd floor. When he couldn't get through there, because the door was blocked, then he went up to the 33rd floor because of video surveillance. So, but for whatever reason, and there, believe me, there is a reason, they do not want to put him on the 31st floor. I haven't gotten that part quite figured out yet, but we're getting there. Uh, imperative that we believe that that L bracket was on that door. And... It was preventing it from opening, and it was screwed to the door and to the door frame. It's an L bracket, people. <laughs> Who doesn't know that that's going to screw two two separate places, obviously. But they feel the need to let us know that it was screwed to the door and the door frame and pretty much every time it's mentioned. Oh, my favorite part, the house phone. I'm sorry, you guys, but... This cracks me up. It's just so, it's just so ridiculous. It's imperative that we believe that he called security dispatch from the house phone in the foyer. You know that house phone that's mounted on the wall that he picked up, that he talked on, that he ended the call. He started the call on that phone. He ended the call on that phone. He had to pick it up when he started the call. He had to put it back down when he ended the call. I mean, over the top ridiculous. Uh, we need to believe that engineering was dispatched to check the door with the L bracket. We They want us to believe that Jesus heard rapid drilling sounds from room 32135. They want us also to believe that he heard automatic gunfire and was shot while he was walking down the hallway. They need us to believe, and we've even got some audio of this, that he notifies on his radio that he was, that shots were fired. Hey, 
Okay, that's believe that that was real believable. <laughs> Not, but anyway, that's what they put out there. A week or two later, not exactly sure when that came out, but obviously, do I think that that was that call he made as he was taking cover in the alcove of rooms one twenty two and one twenty four? Eh, that'd be a negative. But um, we need to believe that he notified dispatch that he was shot, but, but not the first time when he radios because, you know, he didn't want to tie up radio because they were going to need that radio. Um, we need to believe that he told Stephen to take cover you know, as shots are coming down the hall and he's taking cover. Now, the points that they want to make about Stephen was that he was on the 62nd floor when he was dispatched to the 32nd floor. You know that L bracket that was screwed in two places on that door, that Stephen had tools and equipment with him, and that he saw Jesus hiding in alcove of rooms 32, 122, and 32, 134. They also would think it was really cool of us if we believed that Stephen thought he heard a jackhammer sound in the distance as he was round in the corner and that he realized it was rapid gunfire coming from the end of the hallway, you know, room 32135. And when the gunfire stopped for a minute, he heard Jesus tell him to take cover. They would think that was really awesome if we believed that. Also, that you know, he took cover in alcove of rooms 32, 119, and 117, and that he called his dispatch to report someone was firing a rifle on the 32nd floor down the hallway. And we're gonna take a listen to that little ditty. Okay, here we go. And there you have it. Stephen's call about the gunfire. Actually, <laughs> I would say his is a little bit more believable than Jesus. That's just my opinion. And anything probably would be more believable than that piece of shit audio from Jesus. Now, we're going to break down the reasons why they need us to believe each of these crucial points. They need us to believe that the last room Jesus checked was the 32129. That gives reason, uh, Jesus a reason for being on the 32nd floor. The blocked door and the L bracket? Well, Let's go back to the Ellen interview just for a moment. Again, I'm sorry. I know it's painful. I'm not really trying to hurt you guys. But let's let Jesus tell us why we need to believe that that L bracket was on that door. Okay, so we're going to listen to Jesus again, but 
what I did is I pulled up the transcript and it's not a hundred percent all the time and some of the some of the times that how it transcribes is actually quite hilarious but it can give you sometimes it picks up things that you don't pick up and you're like oh so and that's fine we really don't need to see his face anyway but let's listen to when he's talking about when ellen's leading him down the path of the door being uh, barricaded That's weird. Why would somebody put brackets on the door? Yeah, that's just uh, out of the ordinary. That was the beginning. Yeah. Okay. And then you walk out of this, and this just slammed? Um, well, when I was in between that area, I was calling uh, Superior Dispatch to get transferred to engineering. Uh, they didn't know anything about it, so uh, they dispatched an engineer to uh, go uh, verify what that was. Um, that's when you got called. Yes. Okay. Okay. Oops. Okay. He just told us to verify what that was. Why would he need somebody to verify what that was? It's an L bracket. It's not rocket science here, people. He wasn't shot. Nobody was shot yet. So he knew when he says get transferred. He's going to call to get transferred to, you know, why didn't he just call maintenance directly? It, because he needs to say, because that's what they're telling him to say about the transferring and we need this verified and da 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 da. Wouldn't you say, I need to call? And even if he called security and they transfer him to maintenance, I need a maintenance person to get down here and fix this or open it up or whatever, not verify what it was. So right there, there, he's telling us that he, this is a part of the lie that they need and they need this damn bracket verified that it was on there by an engineering, a maintenance engineering guy. That's how I take it because it's so absurd. It's so absurd. It is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Now, a little off track here, but as I was going through this, um, when he says there was something in the transcript that I didn't hear him say, he says it, but you can't really hear him clearly. But when you're looking at the transcript, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Um, Okay, so he, let's go back to when he approaches the door. Let's do that. I approached the door, uh, it didn't open, and you know, it was blocked off, so I had to reroute. Um, Is that a normal thing, that the door at the fire escape, or the stairwell would be blocked off? No, they're always supposed to remain open. Right. And so, um, after I would drop down. Now, I came back to the hallway, uh, and then I approached the room, got into the door. Okay, that that's weird. Now, I think when he says, I would drop down, meaning drop down to the 31st floor, and came back through the hallway, not back down the little hallway. That's what got me at first. So I believe that the transcription is wrong because it is auto-generated. However, and then I approached the room and got into the door. There was the metal bracket holding the door. So that to me does not sound like somebody approaching and going into the foyer to the stairwell door. It's not a room. It's not a room. It's the stairwell. It's not a room. So my theory and my belief is that within every lie, and especially a big lie like this, there are threads of truth 
woven throughout. Sometimes even subconsciously, it just comes out because your body knows when you're lying. And sometimes it just will throw things out there that are the truth because that's what really happened. So some of these things that I feel like I'm catching are those little threads of truth that can be woven and that can even help in figuring out really what did happen. And even though it's a lie, there is some threads of truth that will still help us get the whole picture, if that makes sense. I hope I explained that right. But so it's, it's really, really interesting when you listen to that again. But again, I think why, why would he, he had to get somebody down there to verify what that was. That is significant, I think. Oh, gee, my favorite part. A house phone call to dispatch. You know, the house phone that was mounted on the wall that he looked at, that he had to pick up, that he talked on, you know, with a call when he started the call and then he was still on it when he ended the call and after he ended the call he had to hang it up and it was mounted on the wall. Well, there I believe that there would be no way to verify a call if it came from the house phone, a house phone. My belief is obviously that call never even happened. It didn't happen, simply didn't happen. However, they need us to believe that it happened, but they don't want anybody finding evidence of that call not being made. But if they made it on this crazy ass house phone that's hanging on the wall, I don't think that there would be a way that investigators could verify that. Just my theory, but the house phone thing just it it just cracks me up because it's so over the top in the descriptions of this house phone. <laughs> I just it gives me a little chuckle, so sorry. Okay. Um the drilling. The drilling sounds that Jesus uh, hears from deep within the room. The jackhammer sounds that Stephen Shock hears in the distance. Why do they need us to believe that? Well, I believe to bolster the evidence, i.e. the drill they found in 32, 135. But most importantly, most importantly, and this is just my theory, to cover up the sounds of whoever was drilling the holes in that door. And to me, right there are all the shavings. All the shavings. And the pictures that they take of the door, which is not the door that was actually hanging on there, <laughs> but <laughs> that's a, another story. They took the pictures of that door in the master bedroom, which is this way. So how convenient is that to drill all those holes right here? They can't take that picture there because obviously the door is going to be laying on and around all those wood shavings. So where are they going to take that? Where are, and you guys, oh my gosh, this part of it, I just figured out right now. Why? Because from the beginning, I was like, why in the hell did they take those pictures of that door in the master bedroom? And you can tell it's the master bedroom because of the carpet. That is why they took the pictures in the master bedroom because they drilled them right here in front of the doorway of the master bedroom, but they couldn't photograph. They couldn't photograph right there because they'd have all the shavings in the picture. So where are they going to go? Boom, right there. Boom, shakalaka. Okay, let's move on. Oh my gosh. 
All right. Um, we have to believe that he heard the auto gunfire because, you know, that lone gunman at the end of the hall. We have to believe he, believe he was shot because I say he was shot, but it wasn't on the 32nd floor. We'll get to this, people. We'll get to it, but it was not on the 32nd floor. We need to believe that he did report that gunfire. Again, lone gunman in room 32-135. We have to believe that. The call from the cell phone that he was shot, you know, because so if we're to believe this great report, the gift that keeps on giving, um, he called the first call to security about the L bracket was made on the house phone. You know, that house phone that's mounted on the wall and Okay, guys, I'll stop that. But um, the second call he made was from his radio. He radios that shots are being fired. You know, we have that gem of piece of audio for that. Now, the third call he makes is from his cell phone about him being shot. Now, the reason why we have to believe that that was made from his cell phone is so that we don't ever hear any recording of him saying he was shot by a BB gun or a pellet gun and not on the floor that we're talking about, which is floor 32. So we have to believe that that went from that cell phone because there's not going to be a recording of that. Again, my theory. The cover in the alcoves and warning Stephen and Stephen calling in the gunfire. Um, obviously, they're reinforcing, they're there to reinforce each other's stories. I'm going to be, you know, Stephen will be a witness for Jesus. Jesus is going to be a witness for Stephen. You know, so yeah, this shit went down just like this. This is what we're telling you. We were both there. You know, this is what happened. Um, and let's take a listen to Stephen. Lastly, we're going to talk about where Jesus and Stephen ended up in the alcoves. Now, it really doesn't make the sense to me, but they do a pretty good job in the report of making it up tidy. So, uh, Jesus had walked down the hall from the center course he came up on the guest elevators up or down whichever one you want to believe well none of it is really true but <laughs> that's neither here nor there now because we're just breaking it down so they say he checks that last door he needed to at 129 then he gets in here you know that's where he uses the phone he comes back out so he is on the odd numbered side of the hallway however when he hears the shots and stuff and takes cover he ends up over here on the even side right around in here in between uh, 122 and 124 so he's tucked away here Stephen came down on the service elevators which are back here so he's coming he comes to the center core he says he gets about a third of the way down and in the report, he sees Jesus pop out from his right. So, okay, that's good. And he takes an immediate step to the left. Boom. That puts him here between 119 and 117. Okay. That's all fine and good. However, if it, I feel if it were me, and I'm assuming these two are both right-handed, so your right side being your dominant side, if you were taking cover and remember Jesus says he thinks he's shooting from the peephole which is on this side the even numbered side of the hall to me if I was coming down this way and somebody started shooting I would go this way that would be to my right Stephen so that would be Jesus and then Stephen coming up this way boom I would go to my right on this side however it's opposite in in this little fairy tale so I just found that interesting. 
Um, we're going to wrap it up here for tonight. And I really appreciate you watching. Comment, let me know. Uh, be working on part two. I hope to get it up soon. Thanks so much.